Good evening, good evening, everyone. We always like to start off with giving and welcome to our weekly Torah learning of inspiring and bringing light into this world. We're gonna start off with giving some coins and tzedakah box. Uh, please do it from home as well. How we give, that's how Hashem is gonna give to us. So let's give generously so Hashem can give us all generously. So I'm gonna put a couple of coins in the tzedakah box and I'm gonna say Rafor Shalema for some people that needs uh, uh, like healing immediate healing for Rachel Bas Chaya Yuta Kana Yenta Rifka Bas Shendel Razel Bas Hadas for Fall Chaya Mer Ben Sima Chasha Yosef Ben Devora Leia Bela Bas Chaya Chana Leia Sarabat Pesha Gittel now we're gonna do some we're also sitting in mem in merit for Chaim Chanania Yom Tov Elazar Lipa Ben Malka and and now I'm gonna say uh a, a special prayer for an IDF uh, that got injured. He He's engaged and his leg, unfortunately, was removed. Um, for Shachar Yisrael Ben Roni. If everyone could please write that down. I'm going to say it again. Shachar Yisrael Ben Roni. And he's my sister-in-law's cousin's future son-in-law. Okay. Um, and not that it matters because we're all brothers and sisters. We're also going to say um, for, we're also going to say for Chaim Hanani, no, sorry, for Yisra, this is for an IDF, Yisrael Ephraim Ben Chayat Sivya, that he should be safe. He's in Gaza right now. So we're, we're not saying we're for Shalema, we're, we're, we're doing it, this in merit of his class that he, Hashem should protect him and all the Chayalim and all the IDF and all the Jews around the world. And Reuven Chaim Ben Nechama Dina. And we're also doing this. I do this weekly um, in honor of my dear grandmother, Rifka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda. I hope you're proud. I do this also in honor of my dear great uncle who recently passed away, Chaim Dober Ben Betzalel. To save a life is saving a world. And he saved many in the Soviet Union. Uh, he literally worked side by side with, with, um, with, Two big chassidim, and they literally got the Jewish people out. And tonight we're going to hear how certain families were helped. So um, his neshama should have an aliyah, and I'm so proud to be related to him. We're also doing this in merit of my dear friend, someone that I love, the Holocaust survivor that passed away this week. She was supposed to be, she was supposed to be, last week, she was supposed to be uh, featured on our class to share her story. And she, unfortunately, she she passed away. She wasn't feeling well. So I want to honor her. She was a Holocaust survivor and a friend and just the most amazing person. Chaya Sarabat Rabbi Lazar. May her neshama have the highest aliyah. And I hope you're proud. And I love you, Judy. She went by Judy. And tonight is also a really big um, miracle. And I want to just say that we're going to say tell him in a minute. And before we do... Um, for a few, literally for almost a year, over a year, we said to Hillem, she was on our flyer, Marian Bas Ina Pesiochevet, she was in a very bad car accident. Unfortunately, um, her daughter's friend passed away um, from a drunk driver. Um, and the doctors literally had no hope for her. And they said she's going to be a vegetable if she lives. She's today, she's walking, talking, thank God. She is a miracle, and we help make it happen. Every week we learn Torah in her honor. So Miriam Bas Ina Pesio Cheved, may your may you just have everything you need in your in your life in a revealed way. And we love you and thank you for being part of the class and thank you for sharing your miracle with us. And I feel very humbled and honored to be your friend. We're gonna say Psalms now to Hillim for the Chayalim and the Jews in Israel and all around the world. Um so for safety, and we're going to say today Psalms 20. So please follow along from the screen. I'm going to say it. The, the Tzemach Sadek said, and the Baal Shem Tov said, if you know what Tehillim can do, you would say it day and night. So ladies, don't just say it now. Whenever you have a moment, you could say it, you could say it in the morning, in the evenings, in the middle of the night. It's emergency. We need protection. And this can really help. So I'm going to say Psalm 70. Okay. Lama Tseach Mizmar Ladavid Yancha Adenai Bia Sarah. 
Yisa gefcha shem elehe akai vishlach ezracha mi kaidesh. Umitsiain Yisa deka yiskar kal min kaisecha ve lascha yidash na sela. Yitain lacha chova vecha vecho atascha yamale niranina. Beyeshua secha uvashem elehenu nidgal yamale adenai kol mishale secha. Ata yadaiti ki haishia adenai mishicha ya nehu mishme kachai big blue rice yesha yiminai. Ela varecha vi ela vasusim va nachnu beshem adenai elehenu naskir. Hema karu vina falu va nachnu kamnu vinis aidad adenai haishia hamelech yanenu bian karenu. Thank you for sharing. We are now going to share a short film of encounters of um, women and men who went through the Soviet Union. So we're going to share a short clip to introduce the evening. Give us a moment while we pull it up. Moscow. Sie gibt von Russland Afischu. Also aus der Schneerson, also sie hat also in Amerika, hat mir gesagt, dass mit dem Befehl sie nicht gerne wissen. Hat mir gesucht, dass Menschen so ihr Ei reden. Ich muss mir sagen, wenn die Menschen sie kommen zu ihr und mit ihr gerät. Und, und sie hat gesagt, herzlichen Rebetz, jetzt vor nur bis Lamberg. Und später hat man sie. She wants to go like Schneerson, she's a son in the United States, she will, she will go. But we knew already, as if she will say this, uh, will arrest her, the same thing like her. Her husband was, uh, um, was taking in jail. My mother was, this person was just talking in. And then my mother took you in, all right, you will go if you should, but you go with us, we will make you papers and everything. And she took you in, and she, then she went with us. In the summer of 1946, Rebetzin Khanna arrived in Lvov, where the Hasidic underground was smuggling Jews out of Russia. They paid police to make them papers or give them permission. I don't know exactly how it was, but also the, the people that when the Polish people went through to Poland with their passports, so they got the passports back because everybody was by the border, bought up, they put, pick up the passport and they sent back and they would go according to how many people in the family, that how many people they would send on that passport. So right away they got for the papers and they were looking, a teenage boy was there on the papers. So they took my husband, figured he's a Edelman, you know, like a nice, a nice boy, and they put him, they attached them together. And my sister-in-law, Eti Yurkovich, went with her parents, went also in the same, in the same train, and then that uh, train, the same boxes across the border. The only thing my husband said that they did not even have a roof on the box. And at that time we have the locomotive, you know, with this, uh, with, the, um, with the smoke. So the whole, everybody was full of smoke from it. From my said, somebody else, somebody else. Uh, and she's a lady in the middle. And I'm younger than somebody else, so I sat near the, her. Then I asked her, the uh, train stopped, so I asked if we could go out, I, who, who, who had the train. So he, for uh, an hour we could stop. So I asked her, I go somewhere, would you like to come with me? So she said, yes, I would like to. Then I see everybody is thirsty, nobody things to bring a, a little water. So I, there were pails. I took two pails and brought two pails of water and everybody should have a drink. And I asked her, would you like to have a drink? So yes, pleasure. So I give her a drink. I didn't know who she was. Rabbit Sukhana was with us, with all her sorry. On every station that the train stops, we was scared because we never know Polish language, not of us, but early with a few more. He always went out, bribed the, the patrols and everybody. Even we don't have a, we don't understand Polish. Bribed and we, we went through. Rebetzin Hanna was always scared. Why she was scared? The ink shouldn't rub off because it wasn't regular ink. 
It was made from flowers, from seeds. She was trying to shape and to make ink. That's why she was always scared that it shouldn't rub up. Wow. So the last woman that spoke is actually a very, very dear friend of mine, Mrs. Lipsker, Mrs. Rachel Lipsker. She's Kenanahara, 103 years old. Um, and she lives in Florida now, and she's incredible. She is, she can hear, she's deaf, yet she is the most amazing woman. Hashem should continue to bless her. She was actually blessed by the Friedrich Rebbe for long life with his holy hands, like she told me herself. He put his holy hands on my on my head and blessed me. And Hashem should continue to bless her. We also heard from Henya Lane's father on the on this little clip. Um, so tonight, I'm so excited to introduce to you, um, our, we're going to introduce our, our series from the Communist Soviet Union to the entire world. And I'm so excited to introduce to you tonight, Henya Lane, who's going to, going to share, to she's going to share with us, she's going to share with us, um, she's going to share with us stories and encounters um, of the Soviet Union, of her parents, and she heard it directly from her mom. She's also an author, and she wrote this book. It's The Queen of Cleveland, and um, we're going to talk about it at the end. So, Mrs. Henya Lane, if you could please unmute yourself. Thank you for being here. So, first of all, I would like to tell everybody that um, Chaya is the most incredible person. You have no idea what goes into one little um, Zoom talk, because... We've been in touch so many times and uh, kudos to you, Chaya. I'm very impressed. And as much as I know about you, your stocks just went up a thousand times more. Continue your great work because I think it's a service to everybody. This is incredible that you, add, you asked me to speak about um, our uh, parents. And when I say my parents, I really mean our parents. All of you who have um, had any relatives that came out of Europe, you can substitute their names, especially if you came out of uh, communist Russia, to my parents' names, because most everybody went through the exact same horrible experience. And um, the most incredible thing is that what you did with your life afterwards. So I would like to start by sharing um, the stories about my mother. I did write a book about her because um, listening to the stories at the end of their life, in the beginning was very difficult for them to speak. It was very, very traumatic. It took quite a number of years for them to finally be able to um, um, explain and tell us their horrible um, um, endurance under terrible communist Stalin Russia. But once she started to speak, I realized that there was such a wealth of knowledge that I actually hired a woman that she should sit and just listen to her for hours and hours. And this woman told me it changed her entire life. So the stories that I wrote in the book, The Queen of Cleveland, are based on my mother's personal experiences and talk to this, um, this friend of mine. Um, also, uh, my father had a little accident and I came to visit him in the hospital. And that was the first time he also began to speak about his life. But I do have to tell you that at his 90th birthday party, we made a little party for the family that was here. We Thank God my parents have um, seven children and many grandchildren and many more great-grandchildren. And they are all over the world. So there was no way that everybody could attend. But we had quite a number, a couple hundred grandchildren there, people. And um, I had every family make a certain play of my father's life. And then we uh, had a little stage. And as the play was going on, my father at that time was sitting in a wheelchair. And we moved him from the head table to watch the performance. And in the middle, he just yelled, Henya, come here, quickly, quickly. I thought, I don't know what happened. Maybe he wants a glass of water or something. Anyway, I ran over and he said, move me back to the head of the table. I can't watch this. I'm like, Ta, this is all about your life. He said, for you, it's a show. For me, I cannot relieve it a second time. So I'm now going to share with you a little bit of their life to understand how fortunate we are to live in such so much freedom. And anything you feel that is difficult for you to do in Judaism, 
just think of how difficult it was for them and how they were able to survive. So um, my ma the reason why we call this book The Queen of Cleveland is, this, is because we're going to see the video at the end. The Rebbe actually called my mother the Queen of Cleveland. She was known in Cleveland, Ohio, where they lived for 65 years, as the General of Cleveland. However, the Rebbe, <coughs> who always had a very compassionate look and uh, um, so called, called her by this beautiful name. The goal of my, um, of my book here is to document everything that went on in those years that most people don't know because the propaganda for communism was something incredible. And I really eventually would like uh, a movie should be made out of it, a documentary, a movie, because my mother's incredible, inspirational, outstanding life is like beyond something that I can actually explain to you because you have to read the book, you will not be able to put it down. Also, my next goal is to make it into an audio book if that's possible. Now. The beginning of the story begins with the birth of my, my, my mother. Most of it is about her. I'll put a little bit more about others too. She was born in Gommel, which today is Belarus. But Gommel was a very, very Jewish city until communism began. Communism began, then they began another group of people called the Yiddishisten. Yiddishisten were Jews who left to speak Yiddish, but hated religion. And they persecuted anybody who was an observant Jew. Also, Zionism began, and they started to tell people that um, if you're a Zionist and you come to Israel, you also don't have to observe any of the Torah or any of the commandments, because just the mere fact that you're in Israel, you're already a holy people. So um, between these things, it became very anti-religious, the city of Gummel, and a lot of the people um, started to raise hogs, pigs, and they not only did that, but um, at a time when my parents lived in Gomo, they would barbecue under their window these pigs to tell us because we were the one and only Jewish religious family in all of Gomo, just to show us how much they disapproved of the way they were being raised. At that time, the Jews were very excited with communism because they thought that they're going to stop standing out. They'll just be one of the crowd, like Akasha, all mixed together. Today, you know, nobody says you should be a kasha. They say you should be like a salad. Everybody has its own identity. But in those days, they just wanted to blend in. My mother's father, uh, my grandfather, he did not waver on any of the Jewish law, any of halacha. And because of that, they were thrown out of their home. But when communism does something, they do it in the most dreadful, vicious way, on the most coldest freezing night where there was so much snow and they just threw them out, padlocked their doors. This is a father and mother and five little children. And they said, you are not good citizens, freeze here. Of course, nobody came to their aid because everybody was afraid. They were given the people who believed that it, it was pathetic and pitiful to see them were afraid to come to the rescue. The rise of communism brought with it anti-religious rules. Everybody became guilty of anti-Soviet propaganda. All of a sudden, if you kept Shabbat, you were against Soviets. The, punish the punishment for that was either the gulag, Siberia, or death by a firing squad. Now, I'm just going to show you an example how everything was hidden in such a way the propaganda was so unbelievable. So one of our uncles was in prison and they threw in a young gentleman who has the head of a um, hotel in Moscow. Um, I think it was called the Continental Hotel. And when he, they threw him, it was a handsome young guy. And uh, one of them said to them, so what's your sin? He said, I don't speak to anybody who is an anti-communist. They said, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. The next day he came in, bloodied, this completely broken. And then he realized that there is no such a thing as anybody is safe. They decided he knew too much of what was going on in the hotel. And so he was dispensable. And now he became a counter-revolutionist. And that's how he was bloodied and broken. And then he realized that these people must have all been innocent too. My mother never had a childhood. She was the oldest of seven children. 
her father was never home because he was very busy trying to um, to teach Jewish children what it's like to be Jewish. Otherwise, once these children are lost, um, the whole Jewish nation is lost. So what did he do? They opened up, according to the government's permission, they had a class of six children. The government, the communist Russia said, you're permitted to teach anything to six children at a time. However, in reality, if they found you, they punished you. So that's what he would do. He would open up chadarim, little schools of a teacher with six children. Now, how do we know this? It was so, even the children weren't told about it. Everything was done in the most secret way. But one time when my grandmother wasn't feeling well, she said to my mother, who was the oldest at that time, and was a little bit young girl, maybe she was about 10 or 11 years old, go find your father because I'm very ill. I need medicine. And so she, you know, you couldn't write anything down. You had to memorize. So she told her exactly where her father was. And she came there, knocked on the door. You know, how everybody, everybody is scared. Like communism teaches everybody to be afraid of your, of your next door neighbor, of your sister, of your brother. So they said, who is this? She said, I am Shula. I am um, El, uh, Elchanan's daughter. So they opened the door. She said, I must speak to my father. My mother is ill. They went to a cellar where you uh, make pickles for winter time. They would like have pickles and tomatoes or whatever. There they lifted up a little uh, board and she saw her father who was a tall man. He couldn't even sit. He was bent under just like a, a fetus and some, you know, a little fetus in a mother's stomach. And he had six little children there with a lantern and he was teaching them Torah. And she said, mommy is sick. And he immediately got up to go and help him. That was the first time she realized what a wonderful person her father was, how he devoted his entire life to save Jewish kids. Um, her mother was always busy scraping together food. So my mother was actually in charge of her entire household. However, her father, who was a Moel, circumcised Jewish children, he decided that he better teach his children what it means to be Jewish because there was no Jewish schools. They shut all the schools, all the yeshivas. They shut all the synagogues. So he used to take the old children, my mother being the oldest first with him, whenever he did a circumcision. You can read in the book the incredible um, Mr. Snefesh, the incredible, um, what's the word for that? Um, yeah. Anyway, how difficult it was for him to perform these mitzvahs. But he took her along and eventually, many years later, when my parents moved to Cleveland, Ohio, which we're going to get to soon, my mother actually knew how to circumcise children. And even though she had a moel, a rabbi who circumcised, she would stand there and she'd tell him, you did a good job, I'm going to use you, but you I don't like because she remembered how it was done as she was a young child. Um, at any rate, I'm just going to tell you a quick story. Uh, in the beginning, they were very wealthy because uh, everybody had babies, uh, boys, and they had to circumcise and they were paid very well. But when the government forbade circumcision, then they became literally paupers, they had nothing to live on. Of course, from the yeshivas, they got nothing. There was no money there. And he had no job. This was his job. So in, in, eventually they became so, so sad and so poor that um, he literally had to practically beg for food. Um, the government, when they threw out my parents, my grandparents from um, the little house that they lived in, they then punished the landlord because it seems that you're not allowed to own any property. And also you're not allowed to own any business. There was no such a thing as an entrepreneur. Everything belonged to the government. If you, if you worked, you had to give the government the money and they decided what to return to you. They tell a story of uh, two people who walk into a bar, into a tavern and they're drinking and they said to them, well, your cement, it's raining outside and snowing and your cement is hardening. They said, who cares? It doesn't come to us anyway, it belongs to the government. So um, they eventually killed the um, owner of the home because they found out that he and his son owned a factory together. And that was a horrible sin. You know, it's, you can't fathom this. You can't make up the stories. Anyway, um, they lived there uh, when they threw out my, my, the family, 
my grandfather said, what am I going to do? It's the middle of the winter. They padlocked the doors. They had nothing. So he walked the children to the nearest shul. The shul um, was not really heated in the winter, but he went up to the women's section and they ended up living there for seven years. The benches were their beds. He found some kind of a makeshift little um, stove and um, they survived as much as they could. Now, one thing about communism is when they do something, they go all out. In the schools, it was mandatory to send your children because they taught the children um, to um, tattletale on their parents. They taught the children that there's no God, that Stalin was the father and Mother Russia was the mother. And um, uh, you read the book and you'll see how sad it is how children would um, just say something about their parents. My mommy said something against Stalin. The next day, the parents were gone. You know, it was very, very sad. And they would tell them, in the, then they would put them in the orphanages and they would say, oh, don't cry because your father is Stalin, your mother is Russia. You should be very happy. So the children, the orphanages at night, when it was quiet, they would cry because everybody wanted their parents, but they didn't realize it was their fault that it would put the orphanages that the parents were killed. And so, of course, there's no way that my grandfather and grandmother were going to send the children to the school. A, they teach you that there's no God. B, they teach you to talk about, to tell, tell about your parents. And so they uh, hid the children. And for a few years, they were able to, to, to manage. At any rate, um, one day they found out that, um, that these, this uh, family was not sending the children to school. So one of the Jewish teachers came to the home. It turned out to be on a Saturday. And she walked in and there were two candles on the table. You know, we like more candles. We like as many children as we have. But in those days, my, my grandmother had no money. She was happy to have, she used to take um, a potato and put some oh, margarine or oil into it. And that was her two candles. And she walked in and she said, such archaic customs you're still doing. If we ever see you do that again, we will arrest you and we'll put your kids in the orphanage. Now, if they did the orphanage, they would change the names. So you never could find out who your child is. At any rate, um, read the book, but I will tell you, the next day they were gone. They ran away from this place. The government went and they padlocked the synagogue. And the night before they padlocked the synagogue, my grandmother, just before she ran away, she said, oh my God, what are we going to do with all the Sefer Torahs, the holy books, the, the Torahs, you know? And um, she actually saved them by, by transferring them to the table of a neighbor in Gomo. I want to tell you, many, many years later, when Perestroika happened, uh, one of the grandchildren of this gentleman, uh, they were sent to England and um, they stayed in my uncle's house. And um, he said, oh, Gamo, my God, we came from Gamo. They said, yes, we're from Gamo. He says, well, the only thing I remember is the Torahs. We were little children and we were like running back and forth and bringing all the siddhars and the holy books and the Gemaras and the Torahs into this gentleman's house. He said, oh, that's my grandfather. You know, the Nazis bombed all of Gamo. The only one house that survived was my grandfather. No good deed goes on, um, again, goes without God rewarding you. At any rate, so um, they decided to go where? To their brother. My grandmother had a brother who lived in a kolchaz. You know what a kolchaz is? A kolchaz is a disgusting, despicable, smelly um, farm where they put the people and they said, now, they, they, now build it up do whatever you can there, you know, grow stuff. At any rate, um, my, gra uh, my, my grandmother's brother happened to have been um, uh, an accountant, but they found out that he didn't write on Shabbos. So that was the end of his job. So he became dirt poor. He had nothing to live on. So after they saw how poor he was, that was it. They left him and they had to run further. My mother was about 14 years old when my grandmother said to her, Listen, honey, you have to run away. I'm going to send you to Moscow to a friend named uh, Rabbi Shemto, and he's going to take care of you because um, our, our father isn't there. 
They had already taken away my grandfather for the horrible sin of being a Moel. He didn't rob, he didn't kill, he didn't molest, he didn't do anything. He just circumcised Jewish children. They caught him, and for that, they, we didn't know about it. They took him away before Rosh Hashanah, and they killed him on Xmas. But we didn't know that. It took about 40 years to find out what had happened to him. So please go there, and um, at least we'll save you. You'll be away from Gummel, where they're looking for you. And so my, my mother, at the age of 14, again, she couldn't write anything down, had to memorize, had never, ever been on a train or a subway or anything except the horse and buggy. Um, so she ended up in um, Moscow. It's incredible how she got there. And she worked for this gentleman named Rabbi Shemto. What did he do? Everybody had to work. Because if you didn't work, you didn't get a voucher. And if you didn't get a voucher, you didn't have food, you didn't have clothing, you didn't have an apartment. So you had to work, but you had to work on Shabbat. And there's no way these Jewish religious Jews were gonna work on Shabbat. So what he did was he made a pact with the, um, he made an agreement to the manager of the factory that he would give him a material. They, they would go and they work out whatever it was, and then they return it to him. He would say, oh, these people worked in fact, and he just signed them in that they came on Shabbat. And this way they were able to earn some money to get some vouchers. And um, a voucher meant that you got, got online at night. And you stood a whole night, and then in the morning, a little uh, a little door opened up, and you got a pita or a, or a piece of bread. That was the the voucher, but at least there was something to eat. Um, listen, you'll in, in the story you'll see how many times I literally froze. My mother didn't even know that she froze. Somebody looked at her and they said, "Oh my God, your face is frozen. Rub it with snow." But that that was and the, and the incredible thing is that the people in the Kremlin. Oh my God. They had everything. They had dachas, they had coats, they had food galore. But the rest of the people, the fly on the wall and the human being under communist style in Russia were the exact same thing. Wacko, we can kill him, we can kill you. In fact, my mother told us that when they needed people to work on the um, subway system or on the trains, they would just pick them off the street and they find some kind of a sin that they, just, that they uh, added to their names and they may have put them to work. Um, at any rate, at age 18, my mother met my father, which was very interesting because there were a few friends over there. And one of and his sister happened to, ha happened to like my mother and um, they had to make a shiva. My mother had no clothes. She had any, any money she made, she would send to her mother who at that time lived in a place called Malachavka. And, um, she literally had nothing. So the first time she she met my father, she looked pretty pathetic. She was a, my mother was always a very very beautiful, elegant lady, but you know, clothes makes the person. Um, the second time when she had to meet, she said, "I'm not going until I get clothing." And my grandmother went out and borrowed stockings from one person, and borrowed shoes from another, and borrowed a little beret hat from a third. And my mother, every penny she sent to her mother, she kept a few dollars for herself and bought herself a little green dress. And the second time my father met her, he was like, oh my God, are you the same person? He could not believe this was the same woman he had met just a few months ago. At any rate, this is the thing. In our circles, when we get engaged, we write to the Rebbe for a bracha. We ask the Rebbe for a blessing uh, that this should that this marriage should continue and it should be the right to right choice. So my father said to my mom, listen, uh, the Rebbe is not in Russia. This time he was in, um, uh, uh, anyway, he was in Warsaw. I'm going to write to him. And as soon as we get the answer, we'll get married. And um, there was no answer. Why was there no answer? Because my father's brother, Yehoshua, was at a Fabrengen, which means a Jewish gathering. And as he walked out, he was arrested. And the first thing they did is they hated the Schneersons. The Schneersons were Jews who believed in God. Communism was anti-God. And so how did they know who was a Schneerson? Because they wore a yarmulke under the kasketke, under their little cap. Most Jews just wear a cap if they want to cover their hair. But Chabad wears a yarmulke, like two coverings and a cap. And when they when they arrested him and they 
uh, looked, the first thing they did, they took out the cap, they saw a yarmulke, they said, now we know you're a schnurz. Plus they saw he had tzitzes, woolen tzitzes. That was it. Imagine his crime. He wore a yarmulke and he wore tzitzes. That was his crime. He was 16 years old. And so they, they sent him off to the gulag, to Siberia. His job was to cut a tree. He had to cut two trees. He had to take an ax in the middle of the winter, the frozen winter, and cut two trees. If you didn't cut them, you didn't get your slice of bread. Don't worry, it wasn't a, a steak dinner, a little slice of bread. At any rate, you read through the story, you'll see much more what he went through. But he had received the answer that the rabbi had sent, and he was on his way to give it to my father. So meanwhile, they didn't know what they should do because there was no answer from the rabbi. Anyway, Jews worked things out, and my parents um, did get married. And many years later, six years later, this is something Chaya you will enjoy very, very much. Six years later, um, Chaya's great grandparents, his name was Yuda Chaim, had a dream that the previous Rebbe came to him three nights in a row and said, go outside and sit and watch the train. In front of his house, there was a train that was passing by. So he went out the first night and he sat a whole night. He went out the second night and he sat a whole night. And the third night, the train passed by and my, and my father's brother, my uncle Yoshua, was on the train and he looked out the window and he sees a Hasidic man with a beard because Yuda still had his beard. And so at the next stop, he got off and he walked back. Now, how did he get out of prison? He was bloated. He was dying. And the Russians don't want to say you're dying in prison. So the people who died, they sent them home. So he's looking out the window and he sees this Hasidic guy. He was still wearing his prison uniform. So when he saw him, he got a little bit scared. He said, please, please, I'm, an, I'm a religious Jew. I'm a Hasid. Please let me in. He came into the house and her grandmother, the sweetest lady, Itahenya, immediately fed him and said, tell me who you are. He said, I'm Katsa Mellenberg. And she said, oh my God. And they took care of him and they, called, they wrote a telegram to pick up my uncle. So when they went to pick him up, it was my mother. My, my mother was afraid that my, my father should go because he never touched his beard. And anybody with a beard, especially a young person, that was Siberia immediately. So my father would have like cotton around his face and with a big bandage, like he's always walking around with a toothpaste. So my mother said, I will go. And she went, she picked up her, her uh, brother-in-law. He looked horrible. She said he was bloated, he was massive. And Yudha Chaim would say, you know, as much as we feed him, he goes into the garbage and he takes out more. We just don't know what to do for him, okay? He was starving for six years. At any rate, he said, by the way, guess what? You have an answer from the Rebbe that this is a good shidduch. The Rebbe went to the, uh, he made sure that Yudha had a dream because he had the answer of the Rebbe. We have the answer today. And so um, many years later, we found out that the answer was there. By the way, the grandmother, Itahenya, was a sister to Rebbe Yisrael Neveler, a wonderful man, a great, great person. My grandmother, my mother's mother, would hire him to teach her children because her husband was taken away by the authorities. And so he would be teaching them and they were in the middle of, uh, you know, these machinery and making pins or whatever they were doing there. And she said, the minute Rabbi Yisrael Neveler would start teaching, we were in Gan Eden. We were in heaven. We couldn't work. He was such a phenomenal teacher. And so we have very strong connections there. Anyway, fast forward, my father eventually um, it was very, very capable. He became a manager of a factory. And once he was the manager of a factory, you know, when you sit next to the uh, casa, next to the cash register, you know, you have a few more dollars. So when he became the factory manager, uh, they were doing a little bit better. Um, my mother decided that it's time to leave Russia because she had heard, as this lady was telling you in the video, that the Russian and the Polish uh, uh, government made a pact. If you're Russian and you live in Poland, you can go back. And if you're Poland, you live in Russia, you can go back. And so she immediately said, that's it. I'm leaving this cursed land. And she um, took some money 
and she went to Moscow and she walked into a store, a government store that was only for tourists. Now the stores had nothing, the shelves were bare, there was nothing there. But she walked into this store and she, as she walked in, the guard looked at her a little bit suspicious. And she said, oh, by the way, where is the secret police? Where's the Inca Vader? I'm on my way to them. So he held off and she immediately bought three warm coats for her three children. There were three of us. And she brought them to her cousin she had in Moscow. And as she put the coats down, the cousin's daughter says, Shula, where did you get money to buy such beautiful coats? And she knew communists, one tattletales on the other, that would be the end of her. So she said, oh, my dear cousin, I feel so bad to tell you this. Please, I'm so ashamed of myself. I stole the money. Well, stealing was okay. But to have working, to be an entrepreneur, that was a problem. And so she got away with this one, uh, which was a miracle, a real big miracle. Anyway, um, eventually my mother said to her, to her mother-in-law, which was my father's mother. Her name was Sarah Katzenelenbogen, who was an incredible lady. Her life story is beyond anything. It's 10 movies, not only one. And she said to her, Schwiger, mother-in-law, we are leaving Russia. We are gonna go as Polish citizens and um, get us passports. Because she, what she did was, a lot of the cities were bombed. So if people sold their passports, whatever the passport said, that's what you became. So on the passport, it said a grandmother, a father, a mother, and six children. So my grandmother, Sarah Katzenel, got Rebetzin Khanna as the grandmother. She went to her house in Moscow and she said, Rebetzin, you are now leaving Russia. The Rebetzin said, I am only leaving on my name. Hanna Schneerson. I remember this. Oh my God, Schneerson? That's a death threat. The minute you say Schneerson, you know, believe in God and we don't believe in God. So she said, Oh, Rebetson, you can't go on your name. She said, In my life, I have never told a lie and I don't expect to say a lie now. So my grandmother says to her, You know what, Rebetson? Don't say a lie and don't say the truth. Don't talk at all. I'm going to put a big babushka over you, a kerchief. And you just sit down and close your eyes and I'll do the talking. And so the Rebetson said, okay. She realized that she better go. And they went to the train station and um, they sat down on the train. I just want to show you how incredible, smart and shrewd and way ahead of themselves they had to be these wonderful ladies. My grandmother went to first class. She put the Rebetson by the window on the bench and she sat down on a table where there were four people where you can play anything in the middle of the table. You can play cards, you can play chess, you can play checkers, but they played for money. And um, she started to play. And in the middle of the conductor came in and he goes, tickets, tickets. So everybody took out the tickets. And then he goes over to Rebbe Sakhan in the corner. What's your name? And my grandmother jumped up and she said, oh, leave her alone. Look at this lady. She's old. She's sick. The conductor goes, what's your name? So the people who were sitting and playing with my grandmother, there were three men and my grandmother, and they were playing for real cash, for real money. They got so mad and they're drunk. By the way, when you don't have religion, you have to have something. So in Russia, their religion is vodka. That's their religion, vodka. So they drink. So these three guys were drunk out of their wits because they were drinking. And they got up and they said, leave the old lady alone. You see, she's sick. We don't know whose turn is that. We're not going to remember whose money is. Anyway, she saved the Rebetson. The Rebetson said to herself, oh, my God. If he would have asked me one more time, I would have told him the truth. That would have been the end of her. She would have ended up who knows where. And so she literally saved her life. Um, how did we know the story? We only know the story because many years later, when my parents came to New York, many, many years later, the Rebetson invited them for tea. And when they came in, she said, I want to tell you what a smart lady your mother is. She's beyond smart. She's just, she saved my life. And she told us the story. She said, I thought to myself, sorry, is Mishuga. She's crazy. Why is she sitting around with all these shikuni, with all these drunkards? But now I know why she did this. Um, and of course, since it's had six children, my parents only had three. So my grandmother, Sarah Katzenelbaum, took out three children from the orphanage. 
She paid a hefty sum of money and she took out and she saved three little children with him. Now, let me tell you just one more story. You have to see what these people had to go through. So now remember, they don't speak Polish. They have Polish passports. They have to memorize new names, new names, new cities they came from. So here they're on the train and um, the conductor comes in. It's still a, a Russian conductor. And he looks at the passports and he goes, these are false passports. My father turned white, white, that was it. This is my father, white. And my mother goes, uh, what's going on? He says, these are false passports. Now remember, if my parents are false passports and the whole train is false passports, which they did. So my mother says, no, they are not. He says, oh yes. It says everybody has brown hair and brown eyes. And your little girl, my oldest sister was red. She has red hair. So my mom walked over, she was four years old, ladies, and she was sleeping because this was at night. She went over and like a good mother, gave her a big smack, this is before 2023. And she said to her, I warned you not to play with dye. Now look what you did. You dyed your hair and we're all in trouble. The poor conductor said, oh, leave a little, leave a little girl alone, leave her alone. Ladies, you think she played with dye? This is how much they had to think ahead of how to save the entire train. Um, now, nobody, like I told you, spoke Polish at the, at the border. What they did was that everybody get off the train. They took all their passports and uh, you have to speak Polish. Of course, nobody spoke Polish. So they told the people, if they start talking to you, say a prayer called Yukonporkin. Yukonporkin is a prayer in Aramaic. That, no, like they can't speak Hebrew or Yiddish or Russian. And then they will say, oh, these people went through such traumatic times that they're speaking gibberish. However, there was a very big miracle. The miracle was that two men, two Chabad men, um, went out looking for somebody who speaks Polish. There was a lady, her name was Mrs. Liss. She was a very, very wealthy lady who ran away to Russia to save her life because in Poland, you know what happened with Hitler and the Polish people. And she and her daughter ran her way back to their home and to their factory. When they came home and they walked into their house, the Polish people were so mad they wanted to kill them, so they had to run away. They went to the factory and the people who took over the factory said, we don't want to see you, you're supposed to be dead. So they're walking in the streets thinking what to do. This very wealthy woman became a pauper in two seconds. And all of a sudden she sees these two Chabad people, two people with beards. She says, oh my God, you're angels. Where are you coming from? They said, who are you? So she told them, we are religious Jews. We came out of Russia, we're Polish. You're Polish, oh my God. So they brought him back to the train. And these are the two young ladies, the mother and the daughter who actually saved all of us, who spoke Polish. And what they did was they, they, like, they took the passports, you had to memorize the names and they would call the name, uh, whatever the name is. So that you had to take your passport and go back on the train, take your passport. So they call the name of this gentleman, a Chabad guy, a, a, you know, a religious man, and he froze because he had forgotten his name. He froze. He didn't know was it his name, was it not his name. They called his name a second time. And the guard called a third time. And he got so frustrated, the guard, he just took all the passports and he said, all of you get back on the train. And um, he gave them all the passports. Just figure out who you are. This, ladies, was an incredible, incredible miracle. Now, let me tell you something. A lot of the men, the young ones, not the old ones, a lot of the young men shaved their beards because they were just afraid. It's very hard to explain to somebody how, how what fear is, because nobody in America is afraid of anybody. You're not afraid of a policeman. You're not afraid of anybody. But if you want to know what real fear is, God forbid you should never know, try North Korea, which I tell you, or communist Russia. Okay, anyway, this is Stalin's Russia. So the young guys shaved their beards. But when they realized what an incredible miracle this was, they took the machines, the, you know, they were shaving their beards and they threw them out. And a lot of the women did not cover the hair. There were no wigs in those days. There was no such a thing as a wig under communist Russia, no such a thing. But my mom always wore a kerchief. All the pictures we have of her, she wore a hat, she wore a kerchief. But a lot of the young ladies didn't. They took the kerchiefs out of their pockets and they put them on their heads. They said, God made such a huge miracle with us and they never took them off. And so um, 
let me tell you another story. And so they managed to get through and they were safe. But I'll tell you, my grandmother, I have another grandmother, my Yasha, that's my mother's mother. And um, she went with another group and they, um, when they came to the border, there were three, um, um, there were three zones in the border. One was the German zone, one was the French zone, one was the American zone. Now the previous Rebbe told everybody to go to the American zone. So they're sitting in the, the German zone and they got to get out of there because you know how much the German loved the Jews, even after the war. So they're trying to get to the American zone and they tried walking, but what they did was they would crawl on their stomach at night. There's a whole group of them, maybe a hundred people. And they were caught by the Czech soldiers, Czechoslovakians. They were also not our friends. And they told them, go back. So they went back. They tried a second time, they were caught. They went back again. The third time, the Czechoslovakian soldiers were so mad. They lined them all up, men, women, and little children. They took the machine guns and they were going to shoot them. Of course, God had other ideas. And for some reason, they said, just go back. And they went back. The fourth time they went was pouring rain, pouring, pouring rain. They crawled on their stomachs over the entire hill and they made it to the American zone. Now, one good thing about America, there's many good things, is immediately as soon as they came over there, they embraced them, they gave them food and clothing, chocolates, flour, and lots of other things. And so they were all saved. This, ladies, is a huge, huge miracle. Anyway, um, there's a lot to say, but time is short, so I will <laughs> just continue quickly. Finally, we came to Paris, France. In Paris, France, this was a transition. Um, America did not have open borders. They didn't want the Jews. Um, you had to first stop in different places to decide to get a visa to come to America. So we were in Paris, France from 1947 until 1953. We stayed in Mr. Eiffel Chateau. You know, the guy who made the Eiffel Tower? Well, when he built the Eiffel Tower, his name was Gustav Eiffel. They said to him, what kind of a symbol is this for Paris? Steel is disgusting. So he got on top of the Eiffel Tower and he committed suicide. So his beautiful chateau that had like 30 rooms was given to the immigrants and we were one of them. And we lived there, we, it was very, very difficult because there was one stove for 30 families, that's a different story. Anyway, so we lived there and um, immediately, you know how Jews are, immediately they started yeshiva for the boys, the girls school, they had a shul. Okay, lots of good things were going on there. Now, my father, had to, they had to pay the teachers. They had exactly two teachers. A, a, a teacher who taught them uh, Hebrew subjects, or Yiddish subjects, and a teacher who taught them French. So my father took upon himself to go raise funds. So he went to the stores in uh, Paris and many of them were uh, owners were Jewish. And they'd say, from your Yiddish, you sound like you're Russian. You're so lucky. You're under Russia. You came here. He said, Russia, cursed to be the country. They, they killed my father. We don't believe you. Get out. They didn't believe. The propaganda for communism was so, they couldn't believe that so many people were slaughtered under Stalin and Ashmo. You know, they slaughtered 40 million people, not only Jews, people, 40 million. He's burning in hell together <laughs> with um, Hitler and all the other anti Semites. Anyway, so then they decided to go from home to home. So my father went from home to home, knocked on the door, and he had to raise some funds. I mean, they had to raise some money. And as he's talking to the couple, he sees the bedroom door is open. And the children are, are, are down on their knees and they're praying. And he says, what are these children saying? Oh, you know, we send them to the best schools, they're Catholic schools. And so, well, I don't know, whatever they teach them there. So now my father had it, that's it. So he started going every night to different Jewish homes to teach them to say the Shema, the Moda'ani. And he started explaining to them, this is not a Jewish custom. At any rate, I'm going to tell you something that I did not put into the book because this is the most incredible story and I, was, I couldn't put it in the book. But he came to one home. Uh, my father was very, very handsome, tall, handsome. Uh, they say I look like him, but anyway. <laughs> and um, he walks into the house and he says to the lady, uh, where's your husband? 
And she said, he's going to be home very shortly. My father never went in unless it was a man. He said, okay, just leave the door open. And as he sat down, she shut the door. And, uh, you know, the story with Joseph and Potiphar's wife, we just read about it. And she started with Joseph and my father just ran out and he never went again to a home unless there was a husband there. So um, these things don't happen, but I did not put that in the book. <laughs> um, anyway, um, after Paris, um, in 1953, they finally gave us permission to come to the United States of America. At that time, my parents had six children. Three of us were born in Russia and three of us were born in um, Paris. Um, there were six girls, six girls, three and three and six girls. And America, there was no place for a husband, a wife and six children. Especially my mother is the cleanest person. She was spotless, immaculate elegant but there was no room america had no room for a family of six finally they told us that the only place that we they have place for us is in cleveland ohio and the reason is because during the depression there was a wealthy woman who bought up all the homes and she said i'm opening them up for immigrants and so all, many immigrants went to cleveland because that's the only place they had room for it my parents did not want to go to Cleveland. They tried everything to stay in New York because the first time my mother met the Rebbe and she saw so many shakels and so many beards, she says, oh my God, freedom. I want my kids to grow up religious and to be proud of what they have. But there was no room for us in, in New York. And so we ended up in Cleveland. Now, let me tell you, a woman who had no childhood, a woman who was had so much pain in her life, was left without a father, had to run constantly, had to look behind herself and, and, and was always on the run and always like, it was so difficult for her. What did she do with herself? When she came to Cleveland, she immediately started a, a um, um, woman's auxiliary for older women. She then started a junior auxiliary for younger women. She helped my father in his butcher shop. She later on, um, when she found out that there was a Russian uh, uh, um, immigration to Cleveland, there were over 30,000 Russians. Every one of them knew my mom. She'd go to the airport. She'd wait for them. She'd get them apartments. She'd get them jobs. You should see the doctors and the teachers and the lawyers were babysitting. They were doing menial work, but they couldn't. But they liked to work. Russians liked to work. She would take the children right from the airport, should bring them to the Jewish school called the Hebrew Academy of Cleveland, Ohio. And she would say, put them in class. And the principal would say, Mrs. Kaysen, what should I take an 11 year old girl and put them in kindergarten? They don't speak the language. They don't know Torah. They don't know anything. She said, I'm not moving because if they don't go to this Jewish school, they are lost. Everybody's lost 70 years. The mothers know nothing. The grandmothers know nothing. They are lost. They're not moving. Eventually ladies, they had to, uh, they had to purchase a, a building just for the Russian kids. They got teachers. Hundreds of Jewish, of, of Russian kids went to the schools. And any Russian who was observant today in Cleveland or wherever they went, is thanks to my parents, thanks to my mother especially. It's um, my father. On the other hand, was a shochet. When they went in to see the Rebbe the first time, the Rebbe said to my father, "What are you going to do?" He says, well, my grandfather was a businessman. My mom was a business person. Um, I'm going to go into business. And the Rebbe said, no, I think you should be a shochet, slaughter kosher ch animal chickens, um, a chazan, you should be a cantor, and a rub, or a rub, one of those three. My father ended up being all three, all three. He was, he did kosher chickens. And when he saw Jewish people come from Europe, and go in the pick and pay, that's the kind of the store we had in Cleveland, and buy tray for meat, non-kosher meat, he would give them chickens for free. He said, you can't buy that. I will give you chickens for free. Ladies, you make pennies, pennies, pennies on the chicken, and we'd give them for free. Um, anyway, um, my mother made over 500 drissen, and um, I'm almost finished. <laughs> I want to just tell you that the Rebbe empowered, empowered women. The Rebbe appreciated people who were doers. And he was so grateful to everybody, especially to my parents, because they traveled with his mother and saved her life to come to America. Um, okay. 
Um, hopefully, hopefully soon we will meet with my, my father, my mother, the Rebbe, uh, with Mashiach soon in our times. And um, thank you all for listening to me and get the book called The Queen of Cleveland. There is a link there. You can also get it on Amazon. And now I just want to tell you, somebody read the book. I loved it so much that they made a little book for girls called Defiance for ages like seven to like 11 or 12. It's a book about my mother also. And I've only had the most incredible uh, feedback for this wonderful book. Hope one day it becomes a movie and everybody will actually see it in reality. Thank you so much. I am so impressed with you, Chaya. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Henya. We're gonna share a rubber video in a moment. Um, before we do, I just wanna say, that's where um, Henya Lane got the inspiration for the book, the name of the book, because Henya, if you could share with us what the rub is saying in the video, there's no translation, but he did tell your mom when she passed by, if you want to tell it to us after or before the video. Just unmute yourself. Okay, um, you decide. Okay, I can tell you before. All right, uh, you, can, you obviously have for me. All right, um, in that video, um, we passed by. My mother, my gorgeous mother, says to the Rebbe, today is my granddaughter Basi's engagement party, her fourth, her engagement party. And the Rebbe says, it should be at a good time and an auspicious time. You should tell me good news. And then he turns again to my mother and he says, you are the queen of all of Cleveland. So I will give you this charity and I want you to give it there. And then he says, may you have a Ksiva V'chasima Tova, a wonderful new year. And the reason he said that is because her engagement was just before Rosh Hashanah. The Rebbe called her the Queen of Cleveland. You will hear it now. Yes. Thank you. Wow, thank you for sharing that beautiful video. Thank you, um, Henya, for all your incredible stories and I could listen all day. So incredible. Thank you for sharing the video, the stories about my great grandparents. I had no idea. So amazing. So many of these stories resonate because it's so much, it's, it's really her story is really our story. Like it was, everyone should go home. Like Kenya said, and interview anyone that, you know, um, of stories, um, that has stories of Soviet union. They are gold and they are literally our history and we should learn it and we should live it and we should do it for them. So um, I think it's incredible that the Rebbe, um, you took what the Rebbe said and brought it to life. I read the book and it's really, really good. And I really felt like that it was really my story as well, because I heard so many stories about my grandmother in Russia. Unfortunately, she's not here to share it with us. And like I said, in the beginning of the class, I'm just going to say, Chaim Dov Ben B'Tzalel Olshansky, um, his Neshama should have the highest aliyah. He was the driver. He worked alongside with uh, Mendel Futterfuss, Reb Mendel Futterfuss, and um, and um, Mendel Futterfuss. Sorry, I just uh, forgot his name. Uh, Label Muchkin. And when I interviewed him, I got to interview him before he passed away. So I did tap into what Henya said. We had a Zoom together, and he told me that he was 16 years old and he was driving a truck. And while he was driving, he was with my great aunt from my other side, my grandmother's sister, Raya Rifkin, and which was a Raya Chain, which was uh, Yosef Yehuda, who she said in the story's daughter. And they were driving together. He was her, he was, she was his girlfriend. So it didn't look suspicious on Shabbat, 16 year old boy with polio, like no beard, no nothing. Um, on Shabbos, risk their life. They got obviously permission because to save a life is everything. And you can do that on Shabbos if you need to save a life. And um, they got hundreds of passports and they literally 
um, helped smuggle out all the Jew our Jewish families, all of our families out of Russia. And it was the my great uncle, um, his he was so brave. 16 year old did this. And I know he's in, we should see him so soon with the coming of Mashiach, tap into the opportunities of recording your loved ones. Now we're going to conclude now with, we're going to conclude. We're going to conclude. Do you think gonna, questions? I'm sorry. Okay, hold, on just one moment. Questions? Hold, hold on just one moment. Okay. We're, we're going to, we're going to now conclude um, with a roll call. We have 83 ladies on the class tonight live. We have ladies from around the whole world. And I'm just going to say where our ladies are from. We have Brooklyn Heights, Charlotte, North Carolina. We have Far, Rock, Far Rockaway, Flatbush, Pittsburgh, uh, Great Neck, Great Neck, Long Island, New Jersey, Crown Heights, Ottawa, Bell Harbor, Florida, Great Neck, Baltimore, uh, Boca Raton, Florida, Queens, New, New York, Far Park. And we have ladies from all around the world that tune in after um, Australia, Israel, Paris. Um, Thank you for joining us tonight. I want to give a, sh a big shout out firstly to Hashem for giving me this opportunity of doing this class to our Rebbe. Um, I'm humbled um, to Shandy Jacobson, my mentor for the class, my mashpia for the class. Thank you so much for all your, all your help behind the scenes. To my dear husband who um, helps with the tech and helps get the classes out on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And um we will see you this week on Sunday night. We're going to have an incredible class in honor of my, my grandfather, whose yard site, Shimon Ben, Shimon Ben Mishulam Zusha. So please tune in Sunday night. We'd love to have you as well. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Henya. Um, I hope we'll hear more. And um, Hashem should just make miracles for us and we should have Mashiach immediately.